There we go. So welcome everybody. Uh, give your customers what they want, not what you think they need is our subject matter today. As you can see on the screen, and you're all following this at the moment anyway, is just keep your video off and your audio on mute, please. And throughout, there's a little, on at the bottom of Zoom, there's a little chat button. And if you select Martin Lucas, the host, you can ask questions throughout. So literally, as things come to you, we'll just take all those questions at the end and, and run through them. Uh, let's do a quick introduction. So tell us about yourself, Adrian. Who are you? What do you do? And why should we care? <laughs> why should we care? Yeah, you shouldn't really. That's completely up to you. Um, so my name is Adrian Swinsco. I am um, an author and an advisor. Um, I work in the area of uh, service and experience. Uh, I've been kind of, you know, I got into this area not because I have really a background in sort of contact centers or support teams and things, just because, you know, I figured out probably about 12 years ago, um, after having built a few things that have got good experience at the heart of them, that I really don't like bad service. And I'm on a mission to try and um, remove kind of bad service from the, you know, from the world. And so I'm, my, my, I'm sort of in service to service in many ways. Um, and so I write about it, I speak about it, I run workshops about it, I do some advisory work with kind of, you know, both large and small companies around how to make, uh, basically build organizations that produce better outcomes for both their customers and also their, you know, their people. And so that's kind of what I do. And I've been plugging away at it, you know, uh, writing and podcasting and publishing books and things for the last number of years. And so um, some people listen, many people don't. Fair, that's good. And just to do the, the just to add to that as well. So, so Adrian is a very, first of all, very nice guy, very interesting. So I'm really excited about the insights for myself and also very humble. So when he talks about writing and talking, he's done keynote speeches all around the world. He's a best-selling um, published author. He's been writing for Forbes for nearly seven years now, Adrian. Yeah, I think so. They yeah, haven't got rid of me yet. Yeah, so. <laughs> he's got a lot to say about customer experience, right? And that's one of our big focuses today. Um, Maggie and the team at Customer Experience World asked us to run this as part of, um, there's a lot of change going on in the world, right? And that's a big subject matter for what we're going to be talking about today. And we, we want to call out this really impressive offer that Customer Experience World have done. So. Uh, putting on a complimentary webinar like this is a good plus. But what they're also doing is a two-for-one offer on all of their tickets. So if you buy a ticket to the Customer Experience World event in London in May, it's now all going to be streamed. So you're also going to get a ticket to the Johannesburg one as well. Which And because of time zones and the fact they're kind of, they've got similar intent in terms of customer experience, they've got different speakers, different topics, things like that as well. So it's a good offer. From what I understand from the Customer Experience World team, it's been well-received. Uh, and hopefully you'll get a good insight as to what those events could bring to you based on what Adrian and I bring to the table and what can we're I, also bring to the table. Sorry, can Adrian. I, can I kind of chuck, chuck in there, kind of Martin? I think yep. the also kind of thing is that we, we should probably kind of hasten to, um, to, to add into that sort of mix is that, so I'm going to be chairing the events in London or chairing the, um, uh, one of the events in it, or actually a couple of the, both the events in London. But also, what I, it's, we've got a whole bunch of speakers kind of lined up, but what, because we're going through extraordinary times, and we, were, we will be tailoring a lot of that kind of content to try and fit people's kind of concerns as much as we possibly can. So if anybody's got any ideas about what, how, you know, things, questions that we can, um, that we should be addressing or thinking about or thinking about within the kind of conference, then stick them in the chat and we'll, we'll, we'll take that on board and we'll take in, we'll, we'll make sure we feed that into the agendas kind of going forward. Brilliant. Thank you, Adrian. And then the other thing that we're doing as well is that uh, Punk CX is uh, Adrian and one of his companies. Cap in the Matrix is the company that I run. Uh, we're putting together five complimentary problem solving uh, sessions on offer for you. Real easy for you to grab a slot. You can WhatsApp me. So add the plus four four if you're not in the UK, because I know we've got some international joiners. Uh, or you can just email me. What those problem solving sessions look like will be uh, what you're going to experience today, really, which is us walking through these difficult times and what we can do about it. So first thing to note is that parental advisory is advised here. So it's an emotional time. So if you're not wearing earphones and you're working from home like a lot of us are and there's children about, you have to bear in mind that AJ and I are both Scottish, which means that stereotypical, we express things by using swear words. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're both very honest about things as well. So we do genuinely want you to 
ask as many questions throughout this as, as you go. But we felt that, you know, it's an emotional time. We felt it was good to put out this bit of a warning. That was fair, right, Adrian? Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's the idea is about uh, being completely kind of jargon free, you know, speaking to the heart and being very kind of like, you know, direct and honest and pragmatic. Now, if that gets, if that manifests itself in a few, in a little bit of profanity, let me kind of like say that it's like, it's not over the top. And, um, and you know, um, we don't aim to offend. It's just that sometimes we get a bit excited and we want to impress a point. And therefore we're just, we're making excuses kind of up front <laughs> yeah. before we do anything else. That, that's a better way to put it, right? We're just making excuses really. So let's get, let's get into the nuts and bolts of what we're going to be talking about today. So giving customers what they want, not what they think you need. What were you thinking about? Where, where should we start with this, Adrian? So, <clears throat> so, I, so I've been thinking about this kind of, you know, for a wee while. I've been sort of watching what's been going on and and it struck me that there is a whole bunch of people not necessarily with ill intent but with the right sort with, with they just kind of got good intent but they're almost like bad outcomes in, in many ways um that are trying their best as it were and it's almost a bit like trying to do service as usual but on steroids right okay. And I actually think it's sometimes people are getting it, some people are getting it very, very right. And some people are getting it very, very wrong. Now, not, it's not necessarily all of the time, but it's showing up. And in this kind of time where it's like a, of heightened anxiety and fear and emotion and stress and all these different sort of things, we have to be mindful of all this. So I actually think, you know, the idea that giving your customers what you, what they want, not what you, you think what you think they need actually creates this this other this new situation where which is not service as usual but actually service as unusual and that becomes our challenge you okay. know is like what is service as unusual um so maybe the kind of like the to highlight some of this maybe i should kind of share with you some some examples that you know some things that i've seen very recently that i think that's a bit rubbish oh but that's quite good oh that's a bit rubbish that's quite good you know, just to illustrate what I mean here, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Fantastic. So basically what you're going to do is it shows the pros and cons of how you think uh, people are reacting to what's going on and what yeah. they could be doing, right? Yeah, absolutely. Right, cool. Let's crack on. <clears throat> so the first one I wanted to share was actually, this is from an email that I got from Trail Finders. Um, you see it's dated the 20th of March. It's only a few days ago. And one of the things that they kind of they they they, um, they, they sent you see the strap line in there, which is like secure your twenty twenty one escape. Now I looked at that and I was like, oh my effing god, are you kidding me? Are you serious? You know, because what I thought was, how many people right now, based on what is going on, is thinking about planning their um, their holidays in twenty twenty one. Because that's actually, you know, it's not top of mind. It's nowhere near top of mind. So I looked at that and actually thought, that's so, I understand why trail finders are doing it. They're in a difficult position and they're struggling really, kind of, they're, they're trying to work hard to get through this. But it struck me as being, um, they were operating from their own lens, i.e. how can we help people book more travel rather than from the lens of their customers? If that yeah, makes very, sense. Yes, I mean, it's... Um psychologically you find this a lot with brands right where they're like well we've got product to shift so we're just going to have to figure out a way to shift the product right yeah but to your point the the fact that they're opening with the words secure and escape are both really negative keywords that are people are actually thinking not long term but right now everybody's thinking very short term of like how can i survive how can i protect my family how can i make sure that everybody's safe right so it's like a double double negative really yeah i mean okay. it's like i tell you what it does do is it brings back into into stark and very very clear focus the whole the very simple kind of like construct that is a maslow's hierarchy of needs right you know like a few weeks ago we're thinking about oh you know love and social needs and self-actualization and all that sort of top end of the pyramid right mm -hmm. and this virus thing comes along and we are right back down at the bottom right okay it's all about survival security safety and all those different sort of things and and what trail finders do, and I don't want to, you know, kind of just pick out trail finders because I've actually re subsequently received a bunch of other messages from them. And they are, 
they're you know they're much 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 better so i'm not saying that they're all bad i'm just saying i'm used to using this sorry trail finders just to illustrate a point right okay so yeah. then the next one if we flip that so that that was that that trail finders one wasn't a particularly great one but here's one i thought was actually really good and this is a screen grab off my, my the delivery room app that i took um from last week so which is dated the 17th of march so they're quite they're quite ahead of the game as it were particularly here in the uk and what the screen grab says is look is they're, they're saying look we know people are concerned about this. We know things that we're concerned about the contraction of kind of the virus, but we know people that need to eat and people are self isolating and people need to eat. But we also need to protect our uh, delivery riders and drivers and things. So we're, here's, we're putting together our in place in the app, uh, a process which says, if you want, if you don't want food to be handed over to you, i.e. Pundi passes it, gets close and passes it to you in the bag, then you can indicate on the app and they will, they will ring your doorbell and leave it on your, on your doorstep. You can open it, they'll step back, then you can, um, you can open the door and then pick it up and, and take it inside. Like going, brilliant. Even better is they also turned around and said, however, we're also going to equip our riders and our drivers with the ability to select that option too, so they can then choose to protect themselves. And I looked at that and I was like, oh, I like that. It's just so kind of like double-sided, two-sided thinking, empathetic on both sides. They're like we 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 know kind of like uh, what is um, what is going on, and we understand it. We understand the service that we're doing is important, but we have to look after people and everybody on, on all sides of the uh, on all sides of the piece. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, that's a brilliant one. We had a comment from a lady called Amanda saying that Uber's done the same thing here, and that's in Cape Town in South Africa. So that's really cool. Awesome. The um, and then, so if I think about the, the next one, and, and it's another travel example, but I'm going to I'm going to pick on them anyway, is because it's another, again it's dated 18th of March, and it's just another example of sort of like people thinking about. Goodness comes back to that that point, giving people what they can, they think they want rather than what they need. Right. But EasyJet, the one that they, they, this was their an email that they got, uh, uh, I got from them, and it was all about like, and the strap line leads with winter 2021 sort of like flights like winter sun getaway go skiing all that type of stuff we're, they're like going we're bringing our schedule forward so you can book these flights with us now now in the midst of all that around the, if you remember things are moving fast right now in around the 18th of march you know the news is dominated by well in the midst of all the kind of the coronavirus or stuff it's also kind of dominated by airlines kind of like thinking that they're going to go to the wall that they're going right. to fail <clears throat> so you look at it and go, where's the security in that? You're trying to flog me flights right now. Then people are hearing on the news, well, are airlines going to be around right now? Uh, you know, in kind of like six months, given that we haven't got, gone through it. Now, if you read further down, they're actually kind of like saying, you might have flights booked with us right now. And therefore, we're <clears throat> bringing our schedule forward um, to allow you to kind of like shift the bookings at no charge to you. So they're waived the, waiving their the charge administration. Uh, the 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 date change or flight change uh, administration charge. Yeah, so they can they, they can actually book them further out. Now, the problem is that bit of the, that that the important part of the message, which is you've got flights booked, you might want to change them, gets lost in the whole thing. Buy more flights for winter twenty twenty one. Yeah, because it's leading with sales over service, right? It should be service first. Exactly, exactly. So it's a bit like going, oh my word! I looked at that, I was like, are you? kidding me and then i looked into it and like going oh you got that so wrong you should have flipped it the other way around it's like we know this is happening therefore we've done this i bring our schedule forward to allow you to rebook or create a kind of a credit note or a voucher which will allow you to kind of give you the security and flexibility that that, that you need right now yeah, and to be and to be clear, where we're getting to so far, we're not saying that sales is bad. We're saying it's about the flow and what you're actually understanding about what your customers need to know right now, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's not saying about you know, sales is sales is an essential part of business, right? But it's actually you know we've all probably been in front of of a, of, a, of a salesperson who is just clumsy, right? And it's just not it does it's not cognizant of kind of what's happening in front of them. And then you take this, this other example, which is, is another one from, which comes from Australia, which is kind of being reflected in other parts of the world where 
they have started, given that there's been a big run on lots of different kind of products, they've actually put together a, um, a program where they have got dedicated times early in the morning that is only for pensioners to shop and all the vulnerable customers. And we've seen, a, and, and I think that's, that's interesting and it's, and it's really good because they're actually starting to respond to, to, to the, the customers that need the most help and prioritizing those that need the most help, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. The, the challenge with I've seen that we're seeing that getting replicated from all over uh, all over the world. The problem with that is that we are seeing a lot of people acting irresponsibly and stupid and recklessly, um, and trying to um, get in on those kind of like these dedicated times because it's it's all it's all about them what they want. So they're neither elderly and or neither kind of like a vulnerable or disabled or whatever. And so those things are if you're going to do those things, you have to do them. You have to police them or find a way of policing them to help the people that most that need the most help. Okay, wonderful. And then the final, uh, you know, not the final one. There's the, the penultimate one, which is just tragic. And I'm I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed to say it's from a Scottish hotel. So the the, the gentleman on the um, on the on the left hand side is a, a gentleman by the name of Alvaro, and he worked in a hotel up near Aviemore in Scotland. And they got, they all got these um, these letters. Now we know that hotels are kind of um, are shutting down all over the place, and going into furlough and all that sort of stuff. And they're actually kind of laying a lot of people off now. But if you don't, if you know anything about the, the north of Scotland, um, so sorry. Isabel, can you turn your mic off, please? I got it. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Right. Sorry to call you out, Isabel. Um, anyway. So if you know anything about the, north, the northern parts of Scotland, it's quite remote and there's not a lot of kind of people around. A, it relies on tourism. Now, but the thing is that when they, these people got laid off, many of the staff were living in the hotel, in hotel accommodation. But they were told they were, they were let go and then they were told to vacate the, kind of the, the, the staff accommodation immediately, leaving a situation like this where the Alvaro sat on the, kind of the doorstep having nowhere to go, right? Um, and I just thought it was just absolutely unthinking of it. It's like, how much effort would it have taken to allow the staff to actually stay in the accommodation until they figured something else out? Now, however long that kind of might be. The company, when, when pressed on this, and when it kind of came out in the press, kind of came, came, came out and said, oh, I'm sorry, this was an admin error. I'm like going, are you kidding me? That's not a kind of that letter. If you read it, that's a composed letter. Somebody has to sign off on that. How can yeah, that there's be? No, ad- there's no free thinking AI machine writing letters <laughs> based on admin at the moment. No, this right is an ex- this is an right. exceptional situation that somebody's responded to, and then there's there's, there's kind of process and procedure, or whatever has come down, and it's had an it will have you know, and this is not isolated. It's having an incredible impact all and people all over the world. Now, here's the interesting thing: is customers remember this sort of stuff, right? These sort of times, right. it will bring out both the best and the worst in us. And it, here's the interesting thing, is that um, in our memories, we remember the stuff that kind of disappoints us right. or that encounters failure or anything like sadness or anything that stuff in the range of between five to 15 times longer than anything that's to do with kind of joy and surprise and delight. Yes, it reminds me of the old um, 10 to 100 rule. We used to get we got taught that I started in the in call centers back in the day and we used to get we used to get taught that rule that, that if humans have a positive experience, like a really positive, happy experience, they're likely to tell ten people. Hmm. If people have a really negative experience, which is your peak emotions in terms yeah. of psychology, right? They'll tell ten people. And because humans love fear and love survival, right, they're more likely to tell ten other people. So if yeah. you put bad experiences to one person, that's a hundred people that are gonna hear about it. So the idea about liking fear and, and all that sort of stuff, it doesn't, it's, um, we do, it's not that we didn't like it, it was we, we do actually, psychological studies that, 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 that have shown that we do remember all that sort of stuff kind of um, much more clearly and for right. longer because it's all related to the, the stuff that goes on in the back of our head, sort of in the kind of our, our amygdala and it's to do with our survival instinct. Right. I mean, these are all lessons that we hold on for, for, for a long time because it's, it, it, you know, these are kind of things that we learn and that keep us alive. Right, which takes anyway. on to people doing good stuff, right? Yeah, and then final one is, here's a, here's a brewing company up in, uh, yay, Scotland, 
in just outside Aberdeen called Brewdog. Um, I don't know if you've heard of them, but they're, they're doing some um, amazing things, sort of disrupting the, the, the brewing market. And they realized that there's this massive shortage of hand sanitizer, but they also realized that they've got a production line that deals with alcoholic products. And so what they've done is they've repurposed their manufacturing line to make what they've called kind of brew gel, which is punk hand sanitizer. And the critical thing about all this sort of stuff is because they know that they can, therefore they did, but they're also kind of like knowing that they, they you know, they've decided they're going to give it away free to the people in their, in, you know, in their communities that actually need them because this stuff is in, is in dire kind of like shortage. Yeah, brilliant. So it's just kind of like going, it's, it's doing the stuff, not just for profit, but it's doing the stuff because you can. Right. Cool. So we're getting some good interactions and some questions coming in anyway, but just a reminder throughout this, if anything uh, comes to mind, any challenges, any thoughts, any frustrations, any questions, whatever, just select uh, my name, Martin Lucas, host uh, in the chat and Zoom and you can ask questions. So that, t that takes us to this, the service as unusual. So we've looked at some challenging examples and we looked at some really positive examples. What, what do you think we should do next with this part two stuff? How do we put ourselves well, in the customer's shoes? So that's all very well. I mean, like, and so, yeah, like you say, it's like there's some great stories in there and these things are flowing. It's like a house pipe right now. Right. Um, but the, the question is, is like going, what are we actually going to do? So why don't I, why don't you take us through the kind of um, some, some things around what can we do to put ourselves in, the, in our customer's shoes to help us see things uh, through their eyes and therefore allows us to kind of minimize the mistakes that we might make and maximize or optimize or amplify the, the, the good things that we can do that will really help and they will really matter. Yeah, cool. So just before I kick into that, uh, Adrian did the intro at the start, right? I was waiting until we got to this section to talk about me. So, um, oh yeah, by the way, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> so Gap in the Matrix is the fourth business that I've done. And I gave up four years of my life, didn't have income for four years because I felt that there was a huge gap in the market. And that was based on 95% of all the decisions that we make in life is based on emotion. This comes from Professor Zoltman at Harvard. And if you think about how emotions are triggered, it's based on psychological meaning. So the consumer, us, all of us on this call, we apply meaning to every single piece of service, of sales, of data, of advertising. Like you make, you make 35,000 decisions a day, every single day most of them unconsciously, and it's all based on all these things that come at you. And most of your decision making is, I'm not interested in that. I'm not going to engage with it. So we spent four years figuring out how do people actually make decisions and what are all the triggers that, that sit behind it? Because if you can understand that, you can understand how people, how to give people better experiences, better service, and what your brand service and yourself means to other people, right? Um, so we don't believe that the world's set up to take advantage of it. I'll give you one kind of insight about this and then we'll move on to what we can actually do about it and also how to understand yourself a little bit better. Um, so the problem in, in our opinion is a structural issue and here's a big stat that sits behind it. So only 1.61% of Facebook ads are interacted with. That means that 98.39% of ads don't get clicked at all on Facebook. It's $54 billion of spend and it's 4.832 trillion ads. And you might say, well, how does Facebook survive then? It's one of the world's most successful businesses ever. Well, it's an economic situation, right? Because most people are putting in 10 bucks, and if they sell 100 bucks a product, they're happy. And that's all well and good from a business. I get that from an advertising point of view. But from a customer's point of view, that's why we all, all of us pretty much, feel quite frustrated that we get sent lots of irrelevant ads, lots of irrelevant content, and it's just, in my, in my eyes, advertising is just a part of how you service people. Because if you're giving them relevant insights at the right time, whether it's a product or all the stories that, that Adrian just took us through, then people are not going to respond better. Um, we had to look at this in, in multiple different ways. We looked at the, the personality data. So um, not picking on Facebook for the sake of it, but we all know the Cambridge Analytica scandal, where what they did was map about a bunch of personality tests. And then they use the email of the people that took the personality test to then, if you're a software bot, and this is still true today, a software bot can see the email that you log on to on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And it means that it can associate you from over here to over here, right? So that's what they did with that kind of data. It's pretty onerous. It's probably, um, it's quite frowned upon in my opinion. Uh, programmatic is similar. So programmatic is that stuff, you know, you look at a website and then it bothers you. 
uh, because you didn't buy it, it just sends you loads. Every other website you go to, it pops up product. Yes, we have, le we have legislation kind of like that, that sort of um, that prevents human beings from doing that. It's called stalking. Yeah, absolutely, and, right. And, and restraining orders. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, I mean, my, my lifeblood, most of what I'm doing as an organization is helping people improve their sales and marketing performance, right? And services anchored under it. So I'm not having to go advertising, I'm just explaining that most of society is not built to understand how humans think and knowing how to serve them based on what they represent, right? So we've become too transactional, too robotic, less human in what we do. And most of what we do points away from emotion, it kind of fears it. So what does that mean? Is if you look at what's going on in the world at the moment, right? We've got the, the negative side of how people have reacting to this situation is that we've got a lot of herd mentality stuff going on. Like you could count um, really quickly the amount of emails that you've received from people where they've just got a really general update to do with this virus stuff that apparently is going on, right? <laughs> and yeah, there is got... no, there is no apparently about it, Mark. Yeah, no, sorry, so it was the wrong turn of phrase, right? <laughs> my, my, my point is that brands that know nothing about this are sending emails about the virus that's got nothing to do with their service, nothing to do with what they're changing about anything, nothing to do with supporting it. They're just saying we're aware of the virus and that's about it, right? Um, and it's a classic thing in, in the psychological term of this herd mentality, where humans are followers by nature. Like literally, it's how we learn, we copy others, we understand how other people do things, and we just go round in circles doing things like that. So we've always got to be aware of the herd mentality. And my first tip is just to ask yourself a question. Whatever you're looking to do is, is why are you doing it? Like, are you doing it because everybody else is doing it? Because a business like you has done a similar thing? That could be the case, and often it's worth asking that question because you're like, are we doing it because it's the right thing to do as a business? Are we doing it because the other business like us has done it? It starts and ends with what is your customer actually looking for? Because what we've got going on at the moment is a lot of panic. Is that panic fair? Absolutely. To a lot of people, if they're not getting the right message and the right understanding from government, from the world of science, and there's lots of inconsistencies in a world driven by media from every single angle you can think of it's quite difficult to know who to trust which is really a big basis of false news right so the world is panicking a lot what it doesn't need is lots of people reaffirming that panic and talking about a virus in every piece of content that they send out if you think about adrian's examples the ones that are winning are the ones that are saying we've done something about it or we've changed our service my personal favorite was the deliveroo one it's just said right these are the circumstances you need food, here's how we do it, here's how we keep it safe, and here's how we can drop it off. Done. They've just taken their service and said, right, if we understand and put ourselves in the customer's shoes, what are the current barriers that would stop them engaging with our service and how can we make it better and serve them better? Yeah. Part of the thing that moving on to different ways to, to understand yourself as well, right? Because a lot of this comes down to how you currently think about things. We've all got a pattern, we've all got a mindset in our brain, right? And your mindset is a pattern of thinking. That's what it is, pattern of thinking upon the pattern, thinking upon pattern of thinking. And the thing that I always point out to people is what I call the efficiency trick. Because the brain automates as much as possible. If you think about when you learned how to tie your shoelaces when you were a kid, it was left over, right over, middle, and then you got shown and you tried it and you messed up and you tried it and you got it right, and you tried it, you messed up and you tried it and then you kept getting it right. Right? So when was the last time you thought about having to tie your shoelaces or how to button up a shirt or how to dress yourself or how to make your morning cup of coffee? That's the brain's job, right? It's an organ. And that organ is built to automate as much of what it can as possible. But that's also true for thinking. It's also true for bias. It's also true for selection. It's also true for the people that we decide to hang out with and the ones that we don't and the brands that we like and the brands that we don't. It's always, ask, it's always worth asking yourself a question, particularly in moments of, of crisis, and again, not wanting to, challenge, wanting to challenge yourself, not to be part of the herd mentality, not to be panicking, is like, why are you thinking the way that you're thinking? Why have you got to that decision? Because in this world, we're being encouraged because of technology to do things quicker, to react quicker. We all feel super short of time. But if you can just pause and just ask yourself, why am I doing that? Am I doing it because I understand what the customers want from our brand and scenario, or am I copying other people? I find the efficiency trick's a good one. Is that cool, Adrian? Yeah, no, nice one, man. Um, 
So whether you're on, you're on mute or not, here's what I want you to do, is when you see this next slide, I want you to shout out what you see. So hopefully everybody's ready, I'm about to click it, so just literally shout out the first thing that comes to mind. Grass. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so I've done this test in various places around the world, right? And it's a, it's a psychology test that's been, that's been checked by a number of different people. It's not from me, it's from a, a university. And if you were raised, raised in a, a Western culture, you will say a tiger. And the reason that you'll see a tiger, 83%, 86%, sorry, of people will see a tiger. And the reason they'll see a tiger is that in Western education from the youngest age, we're taught to look for the most dominant object, right? Or as Tessa just pointed out, if you're raised in an Eastern culture, 83% of people will see a tiger in a jungle. Because in Eastern culture, you're taught from the youngest age to look Whatever you see is to look at the relationship between things. And I find that a super fascinating example because if you've ever been in a scenario where you're on a call with different teams, right, around the world, and the boss runs you through something and he says, right, is this clear to everybody? We've got our KPI and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, we got it. And then you get together a, a month later and everyone's done slightly different things. And the boss is super frustrated because he thinks or she thinks that they've mapped it out exactly as it should be. My point about this is how we see the world is not how everybody else sees the world. So it's always worth checking what we're doing instead of rushing behind things because culture is the nuance down to you and your neighbor. It's not just your country and your region. It's got many different manifestations to it. Now we're gonna play one more instinct game and this is about products. So what I want you to do is to just shout out the product that comes to mind as the brand pops up. So the first product you can think of. So here's the first one. T-shirts. Here's the second one. More T-shirts. I have no idea. <laughs> and then the last one. Uh, outlet stores. Right, cool. So, um, so you're just an outlier, Adrian. So <laughs> normally when I do this, Ralph Lauren normally gets polo shirts, or jumpers. Lacoste normally gets polo shirts. Replay, if you're under 30, people are like, who's replay? So obviously you're younger than you look, Adrian. And if you're over 30, most people will say jeans because that's what they were really good and known for back in the day. What's really cool about Armani is you generally get a massive range, right? Some people say suits, some people say aftershaves, some people say dresses, some people say shirts, stuff like that, right? Because Armani's got that range and perception of a brand. The reason that I'm playing that is partly because I love fashion, but it's also about your instinct. So if you think about the, the tiger or the tiger in the jungle combined with your instinct, what you're getting is a great insight into how you make decisions. And how you make decisions is based on how you, as an individual, see the world, the world you've experienced, what's different about it, and all the things that sit around it. It's not the same as how your customers see you. It never is. And I, I often I, find that, sorry. I, I think that's a great point, Martin. Because <clears throat> I think the, um, the, 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 so the idea it, that you're kind of like saying is like, we almost kind of like can get caught up in our, this is how we think, and therefore we're right, yeah. because that's our natural bias is to be right, right? Um, and, but you're, actually what you're doing is you're encouraging people just to stop and to be patient and to yeah. think, is this, am I being, is this about me? Is it about me assuming stuff about my and the customers that I think is going to be work, they work right? Is this about things, the, the, the system conditions that I'm operating in? You know, how will this come across as somebody else? Absolutely. So absolutely on the money. There was, um, the, the most common thing that I find with humans, right? If you think about this automated brain, if you think you about You talk about them as if they're an alien species, you know. Well, humans. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't identify as a human. I'm starting a new trend. It's like I'm a, a human who's non-human. Anyway, let's leave that. So um, the most common things with humans like me, right? Better? Thank you. <laughs> is that, is that you, the brain automates as much as possible, right? And we know that from tying our shoelaces. We know that from dressing. But the thing we don't think about is how we see tigers <laughs> or how we understand brands. And my point about that is that your decision-making your thinking, your interpretation of the world is as automated as tying your shoelaces. So I'll give you an example of what this can look like. So this is an example of what we call a customer first mindset. 
So uh, getting away from like crisis mode, but just looking at like the overarching way that you can look at your service and how you deliver it to people is we did this project. This was all the things that we did for a global fashion company. And what we were looking at is that's a big list of stuff. I'm not going to run you through it all. My point about this is that rather than doing it brand down the way, which is often what you find. So this was a retail example, right? So most brands are going out and they're saying, right, HQ says that our store should be laid out like this. And that's how we should do it and blah, 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 right? The challenge with that is that that's pretty much the hierarchy of how every business is built. The problem is that it's top down. It's the brand deciding everything, right? But if you do it bottom up from what your customers want, you can start to break down all these silos. So if you reread that list, you think about it, we weren't dealing with email or advertising or retail or customer service or store layout. We looked at all of it because we were coming at it from the consumer's point of view. We we're just asking those questions. One of the things that we discovered was that 56% of LAPS customers responded to our survey that had zero incentive. So normally you have to give people an incentive to fill out a customer survey full stop, right? As I'm sure many of you know. The second part about that is that the vast majority of them were lapsed. What that was telling you was that they still love the brand, but what you're serving them, both in terms of experience and product, they don't like anymore. And that's why they become lapsed customers. Long and the short of it is that uh, 62 million in revenue growth and savings. It's an ongoing client that we've got for us. It's just one example of just, it's not us saying, oh, look at us, all the stuff that we could do. A lot of it is just the, pra the practical logic of saying, what do our customers want from us? Because I'll tell you one thing about retail experiences. If you do it top down, you're making a huge assumption. Because if you lay out your stores exactly the same in every city, in every country, in every region, no country, region, or city is the same. Everybody has different preferences based on different locations. And you can know that. Think about the last time that you traveled from the city or town that you live in to another city nearby. And you see people dressing differently and looking slightly differently. They're wearing the same brands, but everyone's got a little nuanced style. We humans are tribal, so we follow that kind of stuff. So retail should be set up so that it varies stock in the same way that you should be varying service based on what people want. So a couple of tips for you. This is on a psychological level. When people think about friends, I want you to play a really quick imagination game. I'm conscious of time, so I don't want to overrun for you. Um, I want you to think about you've had a really bad day at work and your boss was a bit difficult with you. Who's the friend that you're gonna call, right? And now I want you to think that um, you want to have a pizza on Friday night, not this Friday obviously, but let's say in a few Fridays time and you want to go to your favorite pizza place. Who's that friend that you're going to call? And then the third one is, let's say that you've not been out for a long time because we're all going to have to get used to that, right? Who's the friend that you'd call when you want to go out and party after three months? The thing about this is that the brain allocates friends in exactly the same way that we think about brands. It's the same kind of correlation. That 56% elapsed customers, they were still loyal to this brand, but they didn't want to hang out with them anymore because the experience had changed. It's like going out with your pizza friend and they're like, I don't want pizza anymore. I want this food uh, and I want to go out and party. You know what I mean? It's like you can lose your distance and your relationship with a friend. They're still a friend, but you just don't do as much as what you did with them. It's the same thing. The same psychology of how it works in the brain is that same relationship. And my number one tip, the number one most powerful thing that you can look at, and we had a couple of questions about PR and storytelling, is the power of having your customer's voice heard. And that's both an indirect and, and a direct psychological association. So if you look at behavioral economics really quick, it's nudge theory. So how do you nudge people along a decision? The number one is a social nudge. A social nudge is using your customer's voice to demonstrate the value, the gains, the problem that you're solving, how you help them, all of those types of things. We're terrible at asking our customers. And even if we do, we're terrible at about sharing it. So one of the questions we got asked was about um, should you do PR, is word, is word of mouth strong enough? And it's like, we've well, got to tell the right story arc, which is what we're going to come on to next, but absolutely you should put your customer's voice front and center of all that you do. What do you think, Adrian? I think that's cool. Yep. I mean, I think we need to kind of like uh, pick up the pace because we're, we're running out of time and we don't want sure. to kind of like um, kind of do it. But like, so let's kind of think about, you know, what are the consequences of this? I mean, let me give you an example of something that, you know, about how you give your customers more of what they want. 
And let me give you an example that I actually saw playing out in a press article, you know, like um, earlier this week, actually on The Guardian. Yeah. It was, it's related to the virus outbreak. It's related to people feeling, um, wanting to take mortgage holiday payments around. And, the, and the, this is some, in, uh, some excerpts from that article in The, in the Guardian that you can see on the screen. And people have been struggling to do this. Remember, this is kind of related to their, their financial and social and familial security, right? So they're, they're getting angry that they can't do this. Government says they can do it, and then they're having to wait in line sort of like on the phone for hours and hours and on end. And what, what they've been struggling with is how the, why many of these companies um, have not necessarily made it kind of easy for them. However, the interesting thing about that is within all that mix, you can see that the, the, the one in the, on the, in the second column on the right, where Lloyd's has said, actually, we've got a lot of people that have been waiting in line on the phone, but you can do this online. So there's a really interesting thing. So you end up with all this confusion and nationwide has been going, yeah, it's kind of look at us. There's no flies on us. You can do everything online. Right. And what, I'm, what I wanted to, to, to illustrate with that example is that the, the range of kind of things that can happen and the struggles that many of these kind of firms are, uh, are having, because it leads into this kind of the, the, the whole point is that actually many of our customers, however much we want them to, are not actually acting or operating very rationally right now. Right. So I actually kind of think here's some kind of things that, uh, that I put together that I thought actually we should kind of like, we should do this. Um, that these are some of the things that we should think about is first of all, we just all have to try to do our best, right? And that's it. We can't do any more. We just need to do our best. Now we have to set the bar pretty high for ourselves on that, but do our best. But the thing we don't need, need to kind of like fall back on, and this is where it gets slightly profane, I guess, is you, we've also got to hold ourselves to account and we not to be a dick, right? If we kind of that, we have to almost get to a point where that we, we apply a bit of a dick filter before we send anything out anything out, any messaging and everything else because it might be taken the wrong way it might not be very helpful it might be selfish it might be insensitive all these different sort of things but we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard right now because we are in this kind of like uh, exceptional kind of context um, and the other thing that we also got to do this doesn't make our job any easier but we have to communicate. We have to do it more. We have to do it frequently. We have to actually do it more than we think is necessary. We have to almost do it to the point where it potentially makes us feel sick um, because we think it's, oh, it's overload. But like what the, the, the previous examples can like show is like not everybody is going to be able to find or be able to well, they'll see the stuff that you want them to see when you need them to see it. Right. So we almost have to over communicate. You know, right. We have to do it with openness and honest, uh, honesty. Don't make any assumptions about kind of people, uh, you know, and just keep going, keep going. Because, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to feel like the longest kind of like sprint that you've ever been in. Right. It's not a marathon. It's a sprint. But it's right. going on. For, it's going to go on for weeks, if not months. And so we all we have to do. Panic. Yeah. Don't, you know, don't panic. This is like going realize it's going to be hard. Look after your customers, look after your people, do your best, don't be a dick. That's pretty much it. Because, you know, if we can move on, Martin, just to the next slide, because the thing we have to realize, we have collective responsibility in all of this sort of stuff. Um, and we're all customers in some way, shape or form, right? And we need to take responsibility for that. And we need to remember and also remind others that we're trying to serve that, they may be fearful, they may be anxious, they may be going through their own sort of like stuff, but we've got to, we've got to ask people to be like responsible, mindful, kind, compassionate, and considerate on all sides of the organization, because it's only if we work together and then we require, we hold ourselves to higher standards, but we ask our customers to, uh, to, to, um, to collaborate with us on that, do we get to the point that we can deliver service as unusual? And that's the thing that is required right here, right now, from you know people that are trying to help their customers get through this difficult time. Wonderful. And I think I, I skipped way past all the slides. That all right, on. cool. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll send these slides out afterwards so you can, you can have them. Yeah, cool. Are you done with this one as well? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm right through to the end. Brilliant. Okay, cool. So a uh, really quick one about uh, storytelling, and then we'll move on to the, just to remind you about the couple of offers that we got and then go through some questions that we've got. 
So the psychology of storytelling. Mark, so can I quick, quickly say, if everybody yeah. really, um, if everyone wants to kind of, anybody wants to jump off uh, because they have to go to something else at quarter two, that's fine. Uh, please do that. We'll carry on. Um, we'll send around the the slides and everything else, and you, and you know details of how to get in touch with this and where to book for the for the online conference, kind of after this. So you won't miss anything. We're just going to like, you know, we'll we'll stick around for a while and finish off. Yeah, cool. Um, so there's five behavioural traits inside all of us, and this is not optional. This is based on the rarity where you get a bunch of different academic disciplines agreeing with each other. So this is based on um, behavioural science, neuroscience, psychology consumer psychology, behavioral psychology, and it's like this. So all of us have got, we subdivide our belief system and what we enjoy and what we spend our time and literally what we do with our hands between religion, art, music, language, tool making. And none of them are, 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 are exactly absolutes as they might sound, right? So religion can, can of course be a God, a deity, a belief system, but it can also be a sports star or a rock star that you put on a pedestal, right? And it can be a little bit of all of those things. The point that I'm making here is that you should always show where possible that you listen, how you listen and why you listen. And if you can do that with an understanding of, of the right context and relevancy, that's really personalization of storytelling. <clears throat> the point is that if you can weave in an understanding of, of people's belief system, which is the religion, how much they believe in you as a product or a service, um, art, music, language, tool making, that's your kind of design aesthetic of how you can put together some really cool stories and hopefully leverage some of the insights that we've taken you through today. Uh, as a reminder, so I'll do it in reverse this time. Let's say that you are already wanted to go to the CW event in Joburg. If you purchase that, you're also going to get access to the stream for London as well, which means you get a fantastic knowledge bomb of two for one, uh, separated out based on when the events are, so you can get that on the CW website and Maggie and the team will both be sending out this recording as Adrian mentioned along with the slides along with links where you can grab all of these offers. Final point just to remind you again part of what we're doing with Customer Experience World is five complimentary problem solving workshops. Now that's less about Adrian and I just talking at people which is like what a webinar is right it's more about you being able to say these are some problems these are fr some frustrations this is stuff that I'm not sure about what to do um, we'll give you a little run through of what that looks like and then we'll jump on a webinar like this, a Zoom call, but it's private. It's just you and anyone you want from your team or just you, Adrian and I. And that's what we're going to be doing again. Uh, Stephanie will, will share the five pillars of the storytelling as part of the slides and the decks, which is one of the, one of the questions. Um, and let's, let's move on to questions now. So just as a quick reminder, you can select my name, Martin Lucas Host, and throw out any questions you've got. I think I've covered about four or five as we went. Stephanie, I'll just give you a quick rundown anyway. So it's religion, art, music, language, and storytelling. If you can tool make an understanding of those things, then you're going to win. Sorry, Adrian. Tool making. Tool making. What did I say? Storytelling. Sorry. <laughs> Crumbs. He doesn't okay. know his own shit. Blimey. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another question that we had from a lady called Sarah. Uh, hi Martin, you touched on behavioral economics. Do you think that this needs to play a bigger part in our approach to brilliant customer experiences? Now, um, Adrian, before he moved into customer experience and stuff, you're an economist by trade anyway. What's your view of that question? So before we're actually going to get to the tools, we actually yeah. have to think about kind of like the why and the what we're going to do. Right. And then and entwined within all of that is... Um, that there's an ethical question I think we need to grapple with before we kind of embark on all this sort of like stuff. Right. You know, it's the same with kind of like AI, behavioral design, nudge, computer, behavioral economics, psychology, all that type of stuff is as, um, as Peter Parker's uncle Ben in Spider-Man said to him, says with uh, great power become, comes great responsibility. Right. And I think that's equally applied to um, behavioral like you know behavioral design uh nudge theory um ai all that type of stuff is just because we can doesn't mean to say that we should right and and i just i would say some of this stuff is really powerful <clears throat> but we need to kind of use it in the right way for the right reasons um to generate the right outcomes for both us and you know and our, and our customers 
So as, there's too many people that rush in, like you were talking about the kind of the, the, the herd mentality. It's like everybody's talking about this, therefore everybody ends up charges in and kind of, oh, we need to use this. You're like, going, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, I find, so my, my, just to add to that, to answer Sarah's question is that I think behavioral economics matters. I mean, Nudge theory is about moving people along to their decisions, right? But as Adrian said, is that there's been a huge overreaction to what it is. So if you go on a lot of e-commerce websites, they'll have stuff like six people just looked at this product. And what they're trying to do is use nudges, but it actually doesn't influence people or move people along where they want to get to. So it's all about understanding what your customers want and making that your core decision making, not just using nudges because your perception is that it'll help you sell products. Mm -hmm. I was dealing with a really large um, sports retailer uh, yesterday and one of the things that they're doing is they've got um, they're using a nudge thing that hovers on the screen, but it hovers on the screen on, on top of the lead image of their product and actually pushes people away because it stays up there too long. It has no relevance. So you're stopping people and creating a barrier from them actually seeing and engaging with the product. So it depends is the answer really. I mean, Sarah, if you wanted, we could cover that in one of these problem solving sessions if you wanted to dive into it. Um, Adrian, I had another question I wanted to cover, but here's a comment from Ian Howe. Mm -hmm. This has come from him, so this is the first time I'll be swearing. Sports Direct could have done with a dick filter. <laughs> there we go. There you go. It's, <laughs> dick filter is a thing. Yeah, thank you for that, Ian. Um, so, the, so one of the questions we had, Adrian, was that in, in your vast experience, I added the, the word vast to help your ego, just so you know. In your experience of, of customers and all the things that you've done, what's the one thing that you wish brands did more of and one thing that you wish that they did less of? Um, so I kind of, I remember we have a conversation, we, we have a conversation about, um, about the other, the other day, and we were talking about this idea of, first of all, figure out what connection really means to you and your brand right. before you even get to the idea of scale and then reach is because we have to be. Um, honest about the sort of relationships that we want to have with our customers and also the sort of relationships our customers want to have with us right without any assumptions any delusions and everything else and that can be really hard um, but it, only when we do that will we think about actually what is the best way to to engage them to you know to move them to to excite them to kind of you know to enlist them all these different sort of things to serve them and and support them etc cetera, etc cetera. but we have to understand who they are they're not we're not doing stuff to them we kind of like we have to actually kind of consider them like you talked about being a friend he's like and right. you wouldn't you wouldn't kind of like spam your friends right if you did, there'd be kind of like, there would be kind of like... Or, or stalk them to your other point about yeah. advertising, right? <laughs> you wouldn't stalk them, you wouldn't spam them, you wouldn't all that kind of thing, because we have legislation that kind of like helps civil society deal with that sort of shit, right? Yeah, right. So it's like, how, how can we let kind of companies get away with it? It's like, if anything, we need to kind of get companies to actually start being more civil actors and less kind of like it's i'm not saying that being driven by profit is bad but actually we need to think about there's difference between good profits and bad profits right and actually i think we need to think about being a bit more sustainable not in necessarily just an environmental sense but just a broadly you know a world sense and 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 being a you know being a bit more humble and you right. know and, and what we're going to do and how we're going to do it and how we want to do it right there we go so first of all thanks very much um Adrian, for your insights, just absolutely fascinating. I, I love every session I have with you, whether it's a live webinar or just interacting with you, it's great. Now, um, from Maggie's point of view and from the friendship point of view, just to remind everybody, this is a great example, right? Customer experience world, the only gain that they get from putting on this kind of webinar is to thank you, is to say that we know that you're going through a difficult time, but here's a couple of Scottish guys that are gonna swear a little bit and they're gonna give you some <laughs> free help and insight. So as I mentioned, customer experience world will follow up with the video of this, uh, with the slides, uh, with the two for one ticket offer as well, which is a, a great deal. You get to you get to two lots, two lots of knowledge for the price of one. Um, but otherwise, thanks very much for your time. We appreciate it. Apologies for running over a little bit, and we welcome any feedback. Thank you. Cheers.